if you closed your eyes and thought of who you think a Texan is, you wouldn't have pictured our faces necessarily. Our tagline is unapologetic abortion advocacy because we believe you have to address the culture and stigma around abortion care. We're unapologetically stepping out and we're saying this is who we are, this is what we look like, and this is what we are about. It's actually exactly in places like Texas where we have, frankly, the most at stake and where if we change things here, it changes the country. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Don't mess with Texas, that's what they say. But how about your ideas about Texas? Chances are they are overdue for a review. Last September, Texas lawmakers passed SB 8, the most extreme abortion ban in the U.S., criminalizing abortion after just six weeks with virtually no exceptions and deputizing individuals and groups anywhere to sue. This March, Texans voted in the first primaries of this midterm election year amid an uproar over voting restrictions, rejected ballots, attacks on migrants, and an unrelenting assault not only on pregnant people and those who help them, but also on virtually everything having to do with trans rights. Red, Republican, Texas has certainly been a testing ground for backlash policies and politicians. And that could be what's happening now. But could it also be a bellwether of a different sort? Our guests today say that their state could also be predicting how 21st century change happens when people organize differently. What do people who don't live there have wrong about Texas? And what do Texans see as the path to reclaiming their state? Joining me today are activists from several intersecting movements in Texas. Amy Arambide is the director of Avow, which focuses on abortion access, reproductive health, rights, and justice. Isha Pandit is co-founder of the Center for Advancing innovative policy. She's also a member of the Crunk Feminist Collective and co-founder of South Asian Youth in Houston Unite. Emmett Schelling is the director of the Transgender Education Network of Texas, or TENT, an organization dedicated to gender diverse equality in Texas. And we're also going to be hearing from Greg Kazar, a labor organizer, working families party member, and progressive Democrat who won the primary on March 1st and now stands to run to represent a district that runs all the way from Austin to San Antonio. A lot to talk about in what I know is going to be too little time. We are messing with people's minds on Texas, but let's start perhaps with what they need to know about where things stand. And Amy, I'm going to start with you. Um, what is front and center of your mind right now in terms of the threats that issues and people that you care about are facing there in Texas? Thank you so much for having me on the show. Essentially, abortion has been pretty much banned in Texas since September, so over six months for the majority of people seeking abortion care. And that's not okay. It's also not in line with what the majority of Texans support. Texans support access to abortion care. And that's just been the truth since before Roe v. Wade. Texans are having to travel out of state to access the care they need, or they're being forced to, to carry their pregnancies to term. And that's absolutely not okay. And what about you, Emmett? What's front and center of your mind? We are in the midst of a vicious attack on trans kids and their parents, their caregivers, uh, essentially criminalizing them uh, simply for getting care for their for their children uh, with physicians who are actually educated to provide that kind of care, unlike our legislators. Unfortunately, what we're dealing with is an AG who issued an opinion that was based on zero merit, zero fact. A governor who took that opinion issued a directive to DFPS or Depart Department of Family uh, Protective Services uh, to ask CPS uh, to investigate any uh, trans kids uh, that were um, thought to have gender affirming care. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, what it did is the same vigilante sort of uh, 
reporting on your neighbor, uh, really creating a climate that just is not indicative and is not genuine to actual Texas. Isha, I'm going to ask you to kick off, you know, your sense of what is Texas up against and why should those of us outside the state care? What Amy and Emmett articulated beautifully is the criminalization of self-determination that's been happening in this state. Um, Criminalization of many families, of people trying to control their own families. And so when you hear Texas politicians say that they are pro-family, you will know that what they, you know, what they're actually up to over here is actually criminalizing um, safety for many families in the state. Texas is only relatively recently dominated by far right politics. They are terrible and brazen, but they have not been in power forever. Far right politicians, they know that Texas is a battleground state. They are approaching Texas as though there is something to be won here. And so my sort of call to reconfiguration of like how we talk about Texas is that why aren't progressives approaching Texas as a place where there is something to be won, a place that is on the cusp of sort of political and demographic shift. And that is the reason why this is such a battleground state for many conservatives. One point of frustration for me is when people are like, well, forget Texas, right? Like who cares? And then you have the same progressives saying trans lives matter. Texas has the second highest population of transgender people in this country. So if you say trans lives matter, then that includes the trans lives in the state. We're talking about people's freedom, their bodily autonomy, their decisions over their health care. What impacts an individual the most is health. The question of abortion is similar in the sense that we're already on track to see, I think the Guttmacher Institute is predicting something like 26 states following the route of Texas. And just to underscore what's unique so far over the Texas about the Texas model, Amy, why we should be afraid? Banning abortion at six weeks is completely unconstitutional. But the bounty hunter um, component of the bill where they essentially deputize anyone to sue anyone for, quote, aiding and abetting abortion access is just completely contrary to any sort of judicial prudence that it's established. Not only is abortion care going to be completely banned in 26 states after June, but what if this starts happening? I mean, it's already started happening when trans kids in Texas, but it's going to spread to any sort of human right that anyone disagrees with. And we cannot set that precedent. All right, so we're going to switch in a second to what is being done differently in Texas that we can learn from. And and one of the things that's being done is you are speaking very explicitly about being pro-abortion. Well, one of the things is we changed our name to Avow. Uh, Our tagline is unapologetic abortion advocacy. And one of the reasons that is behind that is that the opposition uses the word abortion four times more than our side does. So in fact, they've been able to frame the narrative. They've been able to spread misinformation and lies. They've been able to enact laws based on false claims. And I think we have to change that dynamic. We have to take back the word abortion. And then second to that, like one in four people will have an abortion in their lifetime. That is so many people that you love and care about within your community. And we have to talk about how we support the choices they make and support the families they build or choose not to build. You know, this is... This is about love. Abortion is about love for yourself. It's about love for the family you want to create maybe later, the family that you already have and are you know complete with. And I think that that's one of the most important things that we can do right now to change the trajectory of abortion rights is to just unapologetically declare how pro-abortion we are. I think it's one in four people who can get pregnant, right? Correct. <laughs> Emmett, to you, are, what's distinct in your approach, if there's a comparable distinction to be drawn? To really lead successfully, right, we need leaders that actually are reflective of the constituency, right, that they're leading, of uh, uh, really understand are tied directly uh, to who the people are and understanding that and combining that with their own expertise, uh, education, knowledge, whatever that looks like. And I think that's what we're doing different in Texas is that we're unapologetically stepping out and we're saying, 
no, this may have been who you said we are. This may have been what you said we were about, but like we're here to like clear the air and like let you know straight from us, this is who we are. This is what we look like. And this is what we are about. Well, Greg Kazar ran on a fairly unapologetically progressive and pro-labor platform this spring and won the Democratic primary March 1st. I had a chance to catch up with him and talk with him about how he is now going to run for Congress. Here's Greg. When some people think of Texas, they think of the Bushes or Greg Abbott or Dan Patrick. But I think of Barbara Jordan. I think of Ann Richards, I think of Emma Denayuka and the Pecan Shellers Union that built some of the most radical and progressive unions of women of color in our nation's history. That was here in Texas. Well, lots of folks think about Texas as uh, the voter suppression law or our uh, anti-abortion laws that have basically banned abortion in Texas. And that is all real and true. Um, At the same time, Texas is the home of Roe v. Wade. This is where Roe v. Wade was one. Uh, This is also uh, the home of, I think, the most flourishing and strong immigrants' rights movement in our country. And so I think that we need to sort of lean into and build up and support that fight back, because in so many ways, my race for Congress was a piece of that. It wasn't just me that won. Um, It was that people wanted to go and vote for $15 an hour instead of a tax on workers' rights. They wanted to vote not only against the abortion ban in our state, but for making Roe v. Wade the law of the land and repealing the Hyde Amendment. People overwhelmingly believe in that kind of change. And so that's why Texas to me isn't a red state. It's an underorganized state. And it's time for us to invest in that kind of organizing. We're up amongst the lowest states in the country for voter turnout. If we got most more communities of color and working class folks to recognize that this system that has failed them could work if we all jointly participate That's what changes the state, because this isn't a state of overwhelmingly reactionary people. It's a state where overwhelmingly reactionary people have run the show for so long that most folks say, you know, I just don't want to participate anymore. I think it's actually exactly in places like Texas where um, we have, frankly, the most at stake and where if we change things here, it changes the country. We're closing our shows this season by asking people what they think what they think is at stake right here in this moment that fuels their decision to do the work that they do. We are facing uh, attacks on just people's ability to to thrive and survive. We're in a moment uh, we're on the precipice of even greater war. It's it's a it's a time of real tension, um, but it's in these very moments I think where movements need to step up and be built and be born where we show the best in us um, to be able to turn the page, to be able to say, you know what, we're going to have elections that count and that we're going to include more and more people in in voting. In Texas, where we're saying there's so little we can do about the climate crisis, it's actually exactly where we need to create climate renewable green energy jobs to be able to save our economy for working people and save our future for our kids. It's right now that we can actually finally say abortion rights and voting rights and civil rights are for everyone, right when they're most under attack from a place like Texas. So I think it's kind of in that darkest moment where the light shines the most bright and we have to own own that light and and embrace it instead of saying, oh no, we can't get too close to that light because what if if things get worse? Um, And so this is really, I think the moment to do that. And I think my election shows that Texas isn't uh, a red state. It is a place where uh, folks are are sick and tired of that, and we have to bring people in, organize folks, and and I really believe that our democracy is going to be able to work from us. Coming to you, Isha. I mean, Greg's very clear there. He says, you know, that Texas. He's famous for saying Texas isn't a red state; it's an underorganized state. Now, I don't know if you would agree with that, but it is being organized in different ways. If you look around at the leadership of our movements here in Texas. Uh, ground up organizing. It is led by communities most impacted. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And that is part of the story that is not told about what's happening here. And instead we get sort of national organizers saying, here's how we've done it in these other states. And you know, back to my point, Texas is a very unique political state. The way that we think about the complicated nature of New York or California, 
There's so many nuances that go into national conversations about the red parts of the state, the blue parts of the state, the purple parts of the state. Texas doesn't get that gracious interpretation of being a complicated state. It is painted with one brush and then we're expected to use movement strategies that are based on that, that one particular lens of Texas and they don't line up with the vibrant nature of organizing by impacted communities that's happening here. And I think that's the story. That's the story of what's happening in Texas is the diverse resistance. So Amy, what, what messages do you find resonating that perhaps the rest of us should pick up or learn from, or at least try out on our neighbors? I think when you're talking about abortion, you start from a place of values. You explain why it's important for anyone who wants to access the healthcare they need to be able to do so in their community, to be able to do so without any obstacles that are legislatively dictated and not medically, you know, reasonable. Um, And you have to talk about why that's important to you. And then you can back it up with facts. You know, the fact that one of the largest populations of people of reproductive health age are in Texas and why making like banning access to one of the safest procedures is not okay. And I think you have to talk to them about what's happening in our legislature. And then you can talk to them about the facts. And generally what we've found is when we have conversations with people leading with our values and backing up with facts, people are on our side. And the trans situation, Emmett, I mean, this is personal for you, for your family. Um, For a lot of people, the assaults have come so hot and heavy, whether it's school sports teams or bathrooms or now reassignment surgery. The trauma is lingering over entire communities, as far as I can see, not just in Texas. Um, How are you dealing with that part of this? And what's your, your learning, your teaching for us? To start off, right, it's it's not a reassignment, it, it's an alignment, right? For me, um, all of the like medical care that I have like sought and uh, been so fortunate to get, right, it, it was alignment for me. It was bringing my body, my being in line with my spirit, in line with my mind, in line of who I inherently and deeply and only I know myself to this level. Uh, And so I think like, you know, just as Amy said, there's some fundamental things that that we're seeing, right? Isha as well, right? That that aren't necessarily trans specific or even abortion specific, but but I think they're just fundamental human values. Uh, the, The dignity, the sort of humanity that binds us together. We want to be free. We want to be able to have decisions over our own health. We're not going to entertain that, like, I deserve to exist or not. Like, I think we're beyond that, right? And once we can figure that road out to get through those things that we already inherently know and we recognize in each other, just being in this world, being in community, being in space together, sharing the state, we'll get back to where we need to be. Because at the end of the day, the reason the people in the state fight so hard and deal with our colleagues who aren't here uh, feeling like a mixture of I think sorry for us and just like frustrated just leave uh, is because we know this we see it every single day in our lives and the people that we see if it's on the street or if it's in our community and we know each of these people is worth fighting for. And we know right now, Texans are not getting a fair shake. They're being taken advantage of by our leadership who is peddling in lies and deceit for the sake of sick political power at this point. You, you alluded to it there, Emmett, but I'm reminded of sort of where we began that the, all the mythology around don't mess with Texas, don't step on me, all of that. Um, Isha, you touched on what it seem, what seems to me is a very potentially rich theme for Texans who believe strongly in independence and, and liberty and freedom. Um, when you talked about the criminalization of self-determination, if ever there was a Texan value, it seems like self-determination is one of them. You're looking at three people who identify as Texans. And when you close your eyes before this call, if you closed your eyes and thought of who you think a Texan is, you wouldn't have pictured our faces necessarily, is my guess. You know, and I, that is what makes me hopeful. The very thing that makes um, conservative politicians 
you know, wake up in the middle of the night in terrors of demographic shift is the exact thing that gives me hope. But I do know that the that demographics aren't political destiny and that we have to organize and we have to understand that, you know, that investment in those communities as civic actors, um, both as citizens and non-citizens alike, as civic actors is the solution to, to kind of countering some of these stories that we hear about who Texans are. Over the summer, a 12 year old girl reached out to me because she wanted to have her own rally against SB8. And she got her friends to come speak. And we had 10 speakers that were under the age of 18. And they talked so passionately and so articulately about why they should have the right to abortion care and all the other human rights that were being attacked. And I just was in awe of these young people who are not only just unapologetic in their beliefs, but they were unafraid to voice them to the establishment. And they were just amazing. And so to me, that's a success story, and that gives me hope for the future. What we keep on coming back to you about the beauty of Texas is the leadership we have, why we believe in what we're doing, and why we see this organizing working is because when we say, like, how do we be inclusive, but not how do we just be inclusive? How do we welcoming? How do we learn from one another? That like that's what's making things exciting for me, despite despite right so much. <laughs> well, Isha, I would love you to to kick off closing comments with the personal. Really, I mean, what do you believe is at stake here in this moment um, that fuels you to do the work that you do? Why? The thing that makes me feel most hopeful is the fact that when you ask um, younger organizers to talk to you about the issues they care about, they respond in intersectional ways. Um, Like Amy said, they don't see uh, reproductive justice and trans liberation and racial justice as disconnected from each other. And that's the work of, you know, a broadly intersectional feminist movement that has, in fact, shaped the way these conversations are happening for young people. Amy? Ever since I started telling my abortion story, which I didn't tell for like the first 15 years after I had my abortions, despite the fact that I work in this movement, despite the fact that my dad was an abortion provider, like I didn't tell my story. But once I did, everyone would talk to me about it because they wanted to talk about it. And I feel like people will find commonality and shared values. And we just need to make room for that because I think that's how you affect the change when you have empathy flowing and people just like connecting on a human level but that that's not there's not a lot of space for that in politics or you know the legislature and it's unfortunate Emmett final word from you um what can people do what would you recommend people do if they want to respond in a positive way to what they've seen and heard here today really just support the organizations on the ground. I think like this conversation has been a a great example of what that looks like uh, to have leadership so deeply rooted and deeply invested and deeply visioned uh, for what the landscape is, what the path ahead looks like and what those obstacles are. Uh, And and most importantly, what the support uh, of our people look like uh, through that, that journey. All right. So don't give up on Texas. Learn from Texas. Have a more complete picture and uh, work like crazy wherever it is that you live. That's what I'm hearing from you all today. I really appreciate you taking the time. I think this, too, is a reflection of your commitment to working together, that you take the time from each of your individual struggles to spend some time together. Myth busting about Texas. I appreciate it. And for people that want to see the full uncut version of this conversation, We will post it at our website for those who subscribe to our podcast. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Authoritarianism. We talked about it last week in relation to Vladimir Putin and the attack on Ukraine. It's sometimes thought of as strongman rule, but it's not really that. Those strongmen in authoritarian regimes are propped up by a whole network of people who are willing to snitch on their neighbors. A network of spies. I've seen it up close in East Germany. And that's really what we're talking about in Texas and increasingly around the United States. Snitching, it doesn't seem to me, is much of an American value. 
especially not in Don't Mess With Us, Texas. So what else is going on? Well, voters, when asked, a majority of them in Texas support keeping abortion safe and legal. State court judges who are elected are opposing the governor's actions investigating the parents of trans kids. Voting is a hot issue. Republicans are working hard to suppress the vote. So that, I think, is what it comes down to. Voters versus snitchers. Which country do you want to live in? You can find out more and hear my full uncut conversation with today's guests that gets into more detail about the mutual aid networks that cropped up in the last few years at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Or if you subscribe to our free podcast. That's it from me this time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me. Stay kind. Stay curious. I'm Laura. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.